Time for another board game review, and this time we have the game Millennium Blades, a CCG simulator card game. A, this was sent to me by Level 99 Games, and it's designed by D. Brad Talton Jr. Uh, and it is a board game about collectible card games and the gamers who play them. In a world very much like our own, Millennium Blades is the world's most popular collectible card game. Continuously in print for more than a thousand years, the game has seen countless expansions and untold billions of cards in circulation. Players from around the world and from all walks of life seek to become world champions by mastering duels and collecting the game's rarest and most coveted cards. Still, others live by the game, building financial empires by dealing, speculating, and trading in the aftermarket. Many are content simply to play for fun and meet new friends. Your very own Millennium Blades legend is about to unfold. What will be your path to glory? With your starter deck in hand and a dream in your heart, the time has come to step boldly into the world of Millennium Blades. Let me show you how to play. So Millennium Blades is played over a series of rounds. Each round has two parts, a deck building phase and a tournament phase. In the deck building phase, you will receive new cards as well as being able to buy, sell, trade, and collect. After a certain time limit passes, this phase ends and a tournament will begin. In the tournament phase, you will play the deck you've built and try to collect more ranking points, or RP, than the other players. Players will gain victory points by placing highly in the tournaments, collecting valuable sets, helping out the other players, and amassing wealth by dealing through the game's aftermarket. At the end of the last round, whoever has the most victory points is declared the winner of the game. So the game flow goes like this. There's an optional pre-release tournament, hello Sophie, a deck building round one, tournament round one, deck building round two, tournament round two, deck building round three if there's no pre-release tournament, and tournament round three if there's no pre-release tournament. So uh, when you're, if you're playing the game for the first time, you can do a optional pre-release tournament, uh, and that kind of lets you learn how to play the game. But if you don't do that, then you're gonna have a uh, three, basically three rounds of each phase in the game. So to start out, each player gets a starter deck. These are including like the Red Hill Mercenaries, the Green Dew Bazaar, uh, the Brown Mall City, and so on. You'll also get three cards randomly from the top of the store deck. A character card, you got several different characters here with different powers. Cell markers of the color of their choice and six friendship cards for each character. Now the deck building phase is a real time phase. This means that once the phase begins, players can take any actions they want, as much or as little as they want, until time runs out. Um, so everyone will look at their player boards, which are down here, and they will flip them to their deck building side, which is this. Each player gets 30 millennium dollars of income, which come in these nice stacks. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And then each player will get six cards from the top of the store deck um, without paying for them. These are added to their binders face down. Your binder is down here on your mat. Um, and they cannot be looked at until time starts. Place the top nine cards of the store deck into the store. Discard any metagame card since it's the first turn there are none and reveal a new elemental metagame card. In this case, it's water boost. Then someone sets a timer for seven minutes and begin. So as soon as the timer starts, players may begin taking any of the following actions as quickly and as often as they wish. You can build your deck, make a collection, buy a pack from the store, fuse cards from your hand to obtain a promo, sell a card to the aftermarket, buy a card from the aftermarket, and trade with other players. In your personal area down here, you can freely move cards around whenever you need to uh, and put them in your binder, your deck area, and so on. The only thing that's important is at the end of the timer, you know which cards are in your deck for the tournament, right here, which are in your collection over here, and which cards are in your binder to be saved for later use. That has to be established when the timer runs out. The deck area can contain up to eight singles, up to one deck box, and two accessories. During a tournament, you'll typically only play six cards, so the extra two slots should be used for cards like backup cards you need to change your strategy mid-tournament. You can take cards out of your deck to make room for new ones just as easily by returning them to the binder. So if you're like, oh, I want to put this back in the binder, you can do that and put a new card in the deck area. Again, it's all real time. Now, you may only have one copy of any card in your deck. This is your collection area. Your collection area is made up of two to eight cards, each having at least one matching symbol with all the others, and each having a different star rating than all the others. At the end of the round, your collection will be returned to the box, and you will be awarded points. 
You can only build one collection per deck building phase. So if you don't, if you want to get some victory points, uh, make sure you do that before the end of the timer. For example, let's say I had two animal cards. As you can see, they match symbols and they have different star values. Uh, at the end of the deck building phase, this would give me two victory points for uh, making this set. But the more uh, cards of the same type you have, the more victory points you'll get as long as they all have different star values. So a big part of the deck building phase is buying packs. These are blind packs like you would find in a store. Um, you pay millennium dollars equal to the buy cost, which is this value on the top right. So if I wanted to buy this card, I would spend four millennium dollars. I would just get change for this. And you take that card from your store area and place it in your binder. Oh look, ducky yellow. Whenever a card is purchased, replenish it by dealing a card from the top of the store face down in that slot. If the store ever runs out of cards, shuffle the store discard together to form a new deck. Up here you've got card fusion. Uh, you can convert your unwanted junk cards into powerful promo cards. You can do a bronze, silver, or gold card fusion. You select the appropriate number of cards from your binder, five for bronze, seven for silver, and nine for gold, and place them in the box. Uh, that's basically removing them from the game. So let's say I threw these five cards away uh, and put them in the box, I could pick up a bronze promo and add it to my binder. Once you do that, you place one of your cell markers on that because you cannot do more than one of the same type of fusion per round. And if you run out of cell markers, you can't do any more fusions. Now let's say you got some cards you don't want anymore. You can sell those cards to the aftermarket over here. Place any card from your binder and one of your cell markers into a slot in the aftermarket. So let's say I'm gonna sell Gloronicus here. I would get millennium dollars equal to the star rating, so six millennium dollars and then I would place a cell marker on top of that card. If you have no cell markers, like with fusions, you can't sell any more cards. There is no card limit for the aftermarket, um, but it stops accepting cards for sale in the final six minutes before the tournament. Now, once your card is on sale in the aftermarket, you cannot buy it back or remove it from sale. Someone else has to buy it. So let's say I wanna buy from the aftermarket. I can choose a card with another player's cell marker on it and pay millennium dollars equal to that star rating to the bank. Uh, you would return the cell marker to that player, and uh, ta-da, you get to buy a used card from the aftermarket. You can also trade cards with other players directly without using the aftermarket. However, any trades made between players must be equal value trades. That means that the total of the star ratings of the cards and Millennium Dollars must be equal on both sides of the trade. So let's say I wanted my friend's uh, Zero Void card, which is a four star value. I could trade them for a branded card binder and an X-ray glasses. That adds up to four. Now, if you're making a trade that clearly benefits on one side more than the other, you can ask the other side for friendship cards in addition to the other trade items. These are worth extra victory points at the end of the game. You don't score them yourself, but you can give them to another player who helps you out. So if I was this guy and I give this friendship card to my friend uh, to even out a trade, he would get two victory points at the end. Now you can't score more than six of them from a single player's friendship cards uh, for the game, but still six victory points isn't bad. Now all of this is going on with the first seven minute timer. And once that timer expires, deal each player six more cards from the store deck, uh, then reveal the top card of the type meta stack. So we have the elemental meta stack, now it's time to reveal the type meta. This is Myth Boost. Now let's take a look at these meta cards. So we have an elemental uh, meta card and a type meta card. This tells you uh, what the upcoming tournament bonuses will be. So our elemental boost is water boost. Every player would get 15 RP for each face up water card in their tableau. And this is the type meta, which is Myth. So you would get 15 RP in the tournament for every face up Myth card in your tableau. So these kind of go make you go, okay, maybe I'll try to get water or Myth cards uh, during the deck building phases because I know they'll get bonuses in the tournament. Once you reveal the type meta, set another seven minute timer. After that timer expires, the aftermarket will no longer accept new cards for sale. You can still buy cards, but you can't sell them anymore. And then you set another final six minute timer. After the final six minutes expire, the deck building phase is done and the tournament begins. So to go over the format for the deck building phase, you've got seven minute timer where you reveal the elemental meta, seven minute timer where you reveal the type meta, and then that's the last call to sell cards and then the six minute timer and then you end the phase. Once that final six minute timer is done, the round ends. Clean up everything and you're gonna get ready for the tournament. Each player may turn in a collection. Here I have three different mage cards with three different star values. Um, then I could get a seven victory point bonus for this. But every player can only do one collection per deck building phase. Any loose cards that you didn't put in your deck will be placed in your binder. And then you put all cards from the store and the aftermarket into the discard pile. 
Now it's time for the tournament. Flip over your board and we have our tournament board. Each player will set their current RP to zero. If you have accessories or deck boxes, you can place them in their specific positions. Uh, so this deck box is the Mono Soldier Warband. You can score eight RP for each soldier card in your tableau. Here's the x-ray glasses. Uh, you can, for an action, look at a player's hand. And then with your deck in hand, it's time to play Millennium Blades. On your turn, you may take one action and you must play one single card in either order. If the player is unable to play a single, they cannot take an action and they must pass. You can't play a single if you don't have any cards in your hand or if your entire tableau is filled. So once all players do a, a pass in succession, the tournament will be done. Actions will usually show up on accessories like the x-ray glasses here. Um, and they are denoted by the action keyword. Once you use an action, you flip it face down. You only use one action per turn, either before or after playing a single. And now it's time to play a single. You will place the card face up in the next open leftmost slot of your singles area. So I could play Ducky Pink. Ducky Pink, her ability is that she will gain four RP for each other card in your tableau that has one or more of these attributes, two stars, light, or mage. So I place it here. And that's my single. Most cards give you RP or disrupt your opponents as they try to score RP. At the end of the tournament, whoever has the most RP will determine the winner. Now the top card is the rightmost face-up card on a player's play area. So currently it's Ducky Pink. But if I had another card, like let's say Looch here, Looch would be the top card for me. This card is used for clashes and also activates its top effects. Face down cards have no star rating element or type. They still count as cards, but don't have any attributes because some cards will let you flip cards face down. So let's go over some of the different card effects in the game and keywords. Here's a play keyword with Elko Apprentice Mage. Uh, when you play Elko, you gain 16 RP if there are at least three different types among cards in your tableau. So let's say I had this setup. If I look, I have three different types. So as soon as I play the uh, Elko, I would gain 16 RP. Next effects trigger on the next card you play, no matter whose turn it is or what slot in your tableau you play it to. So this guy is Clangatron, and Clangatron's next ability is the next card you play in your tableau comes into play with three plus one star tokens on it. So uh, if I played Ducky Yellow after Clangatron, then Ducky Yellow would get plus three star. This increases her star value to six. The reason why Clangatron would want to do that is because his action, you gain RP equal to twice the star of the card to the immediate right of this card. So as an action, you could get 12 RP because Ducky Yellow is six times two. Flip effects are activated when a card is flipped face down. So here's Fig Shiitake. If she's ever flipped, you flip all the cards in your tableau face down and gain 15 RP. Ongoing effects keep on working continuously as long as the card is face up in your tableau. So for zero here, uh, each time an adjacent card in your tableau is flipped, gain 11 RP. So that's ongoing as long as this card stays face up. Top effects work as long as the card with the top effect is the rightmost face up card in your tableau. Um, so this guy is the Wasteland Wanderer. Um, his top effect is all players cannot gain RP. And when a player is prevented from gaining RP by this effect, then you can flip it over. Score effects we kind of talked about before, but these are activated during the end of the tournament. This is Ducky Yellow, and she will gain four RP for each other card in your tableau that has one or more of these attributes, three stars, earth element, or mage type. Um, so at the end of the tournament, you'll score based off of this. Reaction effects are activated when the relevant condition is met. So this is the official branded hoodie accessory. It says when you or your cards are targeted by any effect, you can choose a new legal target. Uh, if you do a reaction effect, you flip it face down. And this would let you basically be like, I don't want to get that bad ability. You get it instead. Now let's talk about clashing. Many cards in the game will instruct you to clash with an opponent or with all players. If you clash with another player, choose a player with a top card. In a multiplayer clash, each player who has a top card is able to participate. So this guy, uh, Mummer the Merman, his action is clash with an opponent and the winner gets 10 RP. To do a clash, each player in the clash reveals the top card of the store, starting with whoever initiated the clash and moving clockwise. So let's say I'm initiating a class. Uh, my top card is currently Wasteland Wanderer. I take the top card of the store and it's six stars. And I add uh, the star rating of that and the star rating of my top card, so it's 10. Let's say my opponent's top card on their tableau is Fig Shiitake. They take the top card of the, of the store and they add it, oh, they get five. So it's five plus six, 11. In this case, the opponent would beat my 10 and they win the clash. 
All cards revealed this way get put in the aftermarket up here. And if there's a tie, neither player wins nor loses. There are other special keywords for like different sets. I'm not gonna go through all the keywords, but there's stuff like mimicry, blast off, scurry, anvil drop. Just all of them have different sort of effects uh, and will come up if you play those cards or have those cards in your deck. Now, once everyone is done placing all their cards in their tableau and have all passed in succession, that's when you score. Uh, you would basically activate all score effects. Uh, so we got Ducky Pink here. She would gain four for each other card in her tableau that has two or more of these attributes. Light, light, so four, eight. Um, this is a mage, so 12. Um, and I think that's it. So that she would get a 12 RP bonus. You would add all your score RP to any RP you accumulated throughout the uh, tournament, and then uh, whoever has the highest RP is the winner. You award victory points for each player based on the tournament chart. In the first round tournament, uh, first place gets 21 victory points, second place gets 15, third gets 12, and so on. Um, and then you also, and in each subsequent tournament, you obviously can get way more victory points as you go on. After you score victory points, you reveal a set of promo cards. So for the first tournament, we would reveal some bronze promo cards and uh, each players get one of each of these randomly. Then if it's the first or second round, place all cards in your binders and flip over your play mats to return to the deck building side and return all players cell markers to them. If it's the final tournament, round three, then you proceed to final scoring. At the very end of the game, players will total up all their victory points and see who is the Ultimate Millennium Blades champion. You add up all your victory points from tournaments, uh, your collection victory points, your remaining money victory points. Uh, for every four Millennium Dollars at the end, you'll get one victory point each rounded down. And for any friendship cards that you got from trades. Whoever has the most victory points at the end is the winner. Now there are six characters in the game and each character has a deck building power and a tournament power. I'm not gonna go through every single one, but just as an example, here's uh, Cardian Collecta. Uh, her deck building power is you start the game with a random bronze and random silver promo in the from the fusion area. And all card fusions cost one fewer card for her. And then her tournament power, one of her actions is attach this card to a card in your tableau. That card cannot be flipped by opponent's effects as long as this card is attached to it. And this card cannot be discarded from play. And she has a score bonus of activate a score effect of the card that this card is attached to. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, max up to 30 RP. Here's another guy. This is Maury Cardman. His deck building power is when you sell a card to the aftermarket, you gain two extra dollars. And when you buy a card from the aftermarket, you pay two dollars less to a minimum of one dollar. And his tournament power is, as an action, once per turn, Maury may put the top card of the store or any card in the aftermarket into his hand without paying for it. When he does this, he must reveal a card from his hand, gain RP equal to the stars, and put it back on top of the store. So he can basically exchange a card. Otherwise, just there's so many cards, I can't go through all of them. They all do all sorts of crazy shit. Uh, just randomly, here's like Pyotr Ghost Hunter. Uh, when you play this guy, reveal a face down card in your tableau and gain RP equal to twice its stars. Uh, here's an accessory. This is a branded card binder. Uh, it, as an ongoing effect, you can include three additional singles in your deck. Uh, Batfire, Bat out of Hell. His score bonus at the end of the tournament is gain 18 RP if any two other cards in your tableau share the same rarity. Your job throughout the deck building phase is to just find cards and go, what can I, what cards go well together? What cards go well with the meta? Uh, and just make the best deck possible. Uh, but yeah, that's the game. So this game is a beast. I think the concept is cool and the mechanics are clever and make you really feel like you're buying booster packs blindly and assembling a deck. But, oof, that's set up. Even before you play your first game. You know those millennium dollar uh, money wads I showed you? These don't come like this. You gotta assemble this shit. You have to take stacks of ones, take the little thing, tape it around it, and you have to do that for all of them. This shit takes forever. Listen, I appreciate the dedication to aesthetic. Passing around wads of money does feel really good, but definitely not a game you can just be like, oh, oh I, I haven't tried that game before. Let's try it out for like an hour. No, that hour is gonna is gonna be spent assembling money wads. For your first playthrough, learning the game and just manufacturing the things, it's gonna take a long time. 
there are so many different sets of cards, and they're pretty funny. I mean, you know, you got, like, parodies and stuff like, oh, Super Plumber Bros, and uh, here's, uh, like, a, you know, Giant Mecha one, and here's a Magical Girl set. It's cool from a variety standpoint, but remember that store deck I was telling you about? That giant uh, stack of cards that you're buying from in the store? You have to take 13 sets and shuffle them into one giant deck. Shuffling a deck this big is very not easy to do. And then, when you finish the game, sorting all 13 sets of those cards takes a long time. Basically, what I'm saying is that if you're gonna play Millennium Blades, especially if it's your first time playing it, it's gonna be a long fucking time. From setup to cleanup. It's gonna be a long time. If you're okay with that, it's a pretty cool experience. Setup aside, the actual gameplay isn't that complicated. I like the real-time aspect of the uh, deck building phase a lot, but some people may not like that. If you hear, ooh, seven minute timer, seven minute timer, six minute timer, and feel way too anxious, you may not like this game because it is very much about uh, trying to make quick decisions as time is going. Also, so you may not like that, essentially you are committed to several 20 minute long chunks of gameplay because you have to do 7 minutes, 7 minutes, 6 minutes. That is guaranteed 20 minutes. That's not, oh this game might take this long. You know it's going to take, at least for deck building phase, one hour. But I personally think the whole timer concept is worth it because it puts this pressure on you to get everything done. That's the key to this game. There's a lot of things you gotta keep track of. Buying packs, setting up your deck, making collections, uh, fusing cards, trading cards. It's intentionally set up so that there's a lot of overwhelming choices and freedom for your deck building phase. So, there is a rule in the game where you cannot take back mistakes. And I think that's actually very clever, because what this game really is, at its core, is a mind power management game. The actual game card gameplay is like an afterthought. That's just kind of like, oh, okay, it's a cute little, you get points and these do effects and actions and that kind of thing. But the core of this game is really deck building going, I have so much stuff I gotta do and 20 minutes to do it per deck building phase. I just gotta do it as best as I can. That's where the meat of the game is. The tournament part is fun, if it's a little simplistic. There's definitely some clever combos and you can pull off if you pick the right cards. However, because there's so many types of cards in this game, it can be pretty overwhelming, especially if it's your first time, to try and craft a deck that works during a time limit. The game does allow you to do that optional um, pre-release tournament um, that I mentioned at the uh, during the explanation uh, to get a feel for the game which I would recommend because you definitely want to know how to play the card game before you try to buy cards and assemble your deck. But even then, you're playing with pre-made starter decks in that pre-release tournament, so it, it doesn't really give you the feel of like a assembled deck and playing it, but it does teach you how to play. It's not a perfect card game. There's a lot of room for luck to just kind of fuck you over, but it it's fun, it's cute, it's pretty clever. Again, it's not really the main point. I think the main point of this game is the deck building and getting those cards and assembling the deck. Assembling the deck is honestly more fun than playing the game itself, which is a pretty good game. But if it was just that on its own, that card game's not that good. Overall, it's a great idea. Uh, and it, for the most part, it's pulled off very well. Uh, just know that this is a heavier game in terms of setup. It's a long setup, long cleanup. But once you get past that, if this sounds cool to you, the idea of buying cards blind and trading cards and creating the whole collectible card game experience within one package, uh, I think it's definitely worth playing. Uh, especially if, like me, you are a sucker for opening a booster pack. This game does make you feel like, ooh, what did I get in this card? Ooh, I got this cool. It's good shit. Long, but fun. Especially if you're a collectible card game nerd like me.